Good evening and welcome to The Call, coming to you live from Channels Television Studios in Abuja, Nigeria. I'm Lanre Lassesi, standing in for your regular host, Kadere Ahmed, who is unavoidably absent. <music> 20 years. That's the number of years since Nigeria returned to democratic rule after being under military rule for about 16 years. It has been a learning period for the three arms of government. Of interest, however, tonight has been the relationship between the executive and the legislature. Tonight, we examine how the two arms have worked together with the number of years the, that we have practiced this form of government. Are the legislative and executive arms clear as to what their roles and functions are? Has there been a synergy between the two? And how has the synergy enhanced national development? We'll be speaking with people from the executive, the National Assembly, and civil society as we try to answer these questions and point a way forward for the new administration of President Muhammad Buhari and the incoming Ninth National Assembly. But first, let's take a look at the report which will set the tone for tonight's conversation. The executive and legislature, two arms of government, both equal in terms of importance to any country's development and with clearly defined roles as spelt out in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. While the executive is responsible for policy formulation and execution, the legislature is a law-making arm of government with some oversight powers on the other arms. Both the legislature and executive are not necessarily expected to be in complete harmony all the time, but they are required to build a workable synergy for the growth and advancement of the country. But this is not always the case. On June 3, 1999, then President Lucia Gombasanjo proclaimed the National Assembly, restoring the legislature after decades of interruptions from military rule. Consequently, Assembly since 1999 witnessed a country trying to get used to democratic governance after years of military rule. The legislature attempting to assert its independence and the executive learning how to coexist with the legislature. But tension between both arms of government began to rise in the early days of the assembly, starting in 1999, with the abrupt removal of Senate presidents in quick succession, a situation said to be aided by outside forces, including some members of the executive arm of government. You had this consistent interference and meddlesomeness by the executive. You took out um, Shuvo Kadibu, you brought Evans, you brought um, uh, uh, the other, uh, what was his name again, I've forgotten now. But all of those changes were extraneous. They were not driven by the desire of the, the, the legislators themselves to make those changes. Fast forward to the 8th Assembly, and some say the relationship between the executive and legislature has gotten even more tense, the genesis of which could be traced to a similar problem, the emergence of the principal officers of the National Assembly against the express wishes of the ruling party. A federal lawmaker says the strained relationship between both arms of government affected governance in the country. Is the relationship between the executive and legislature uh, much better than what it, was, or what it is now? Uh, I'm sure we can do a lot. Like the bills we signed, uh, we sent the bills to Mr. President, he returned those bills. Because there were no communication between the legislature and the executive. But some lawmakers argue that the disagreements between the executive and the legislature are normal in a democracy. Because you're not supposed to be a rubber stamp, it is natural that there will be some back and forth. And people may interpret it as tension, but it is natural. There is no assembly or parliament anywhere in the world, except maybe in totalitarian regimes, where there is no back and forth. Uh, the relationship is cordial, is understanding where all Nigerians, everybody has different role to play. And everybody has to do what is expected to do. You are bound to disagree to agree. The most important thing is let everybody do his job. One issue that has been in contention between both arms is the budgeting process. Accusations and counter-accusations trailed the 2016, 2017, and 2018 budgets. 
Even the 2019 budget was not without its own issues, prompting President Buhari to promise a closer working relationship with the incoming 9th Assembly for an improved budgeting process. I will therefore be engaging with the leadership of the 9th National Assembly as soon as they emerge to address some of our concerns with the budget. As President Buhari kicks off his second term and the 9th Assembly is inaugurated, attention will once again be focused on the two arms of government to see if they can find a middle ground to operate for the common good of the country. Well, to discuss these issues, I'm joined by an academician and lecturer at Bayes University, Dr. Abiodun Adeni. Good evening, and good evening, viewers. Eid Mubarak. <laughs> and next to him is a lawmaker who has served in the National Assembly since 2003, yeah. Senator Binta Masi Garba, representing Adamawa North. You're welcome. Good evening. And we also have with us tonight uh, a former lawmaker and the senior special assistant to President Muhammad Buhari on National Assembly Matters, Senator Itayenang. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. And last not least is the chairman of the Senate Press Corps, Israel Tabio. It's good to be here. Good evening. And we also have a distinguished studio audience who will join the conversation as we progress. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Now, those of you at home can also take part in the conversation by sending your comments using the hashtag, hashtag NGTheCore to channel's Twitter handle at channels TV and also at Kaderia Ahmed. Now, let's get into the conversation. Let me start with uh, the serving lawmaker. In this 20 years, how would you describe the relationship between the legislature and the executive? Well, thank you very much. Well, a point of correction. I've okay. been in the National Assembly since 1999. Beautiful. So on the 4th Assembly, the 5th and the 6th, I've been a member of um, the House of Representatives. So no, I think uh, I'm happy that my other colleague that were in the House is in this panel of us to discuss the relationship or that is smooth or has its own uh, rolling balls up and down and all her feel. Yeah, when we came in in 1999, <clears throat> we came in with every enthusiasm to see if we can go into work with the legislature after going into 16 years of military rule. But as we came in the first day, we had an interface with the then former president, Olusegun Obasanjo. It was rowdy because after the... Uh, inaugurations of the uh, speaker then, we had a close session with the then president and it wasn't a rousy, I mean a good uh, interface and the thing is that I, the president, will do this, I, the president, I remember. And I said what well, the constitution said, we the people. So it is not the issue of I, but the issue of the people that have, I mean, elected us to represent them to now see how nation building can occur without us having a rackle. But the fourth assembly, I think, uh, kind of the, bore out all the issues within the legislature and the executive. But the thing is that the constitution cannot, uh, must be adhered to section 58 of the constitution. It gave us the mandate of how to make laws for the good of our people. And I think that is the core mandate of the legislature. Yeah, but, 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 what, but what I would like to understand is this. You've st stated how it started. Looking from that time till now, how would you say the relationship? I think the relationship has been um, not really totally or completely smooth, but obviously when there are clear demarcations where uh, powers of the leg executive or the legislature was going to be usurped by the executive, then obviously the legislature will raise an eyeball. But one critical areas where the legislature and the um, executive were not almost completely in agreement is when it comes to the budgeting process. 
of 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 the of, of the government, and that is where the bone of contentions from 1999, 2003, and 2007 has been constantly the bone of contentions of who holds the mandate or the power of the post. Okay, L let me bring in bring you in here, Dr. Ita Enang. So, what, what's your own perspective? <coughs> Twenty years. Twenty years. I think the relationship that each legislature has with the executive has been defined by the first the way that the leadership emerges mm -hmm. two the the um, person of sometimes the president three the disposition of the presiding officers because you can emerge from the government from sorry from a uh, support of the executive and then you seem to want to tow the line of the executive completely your colleagues on the floor will dispo will sack you and they will remove you because you'll be seen as a rubber stamp and you can emerge from among the people among the from uh, uh, exclusively or support of the members then the executive may not be un may not be comfortable and you will be finding it difficult trying to balance both interests. But the most important thing here is this. The kind of relationship that has existed between the executive and the legislature from 1999 to till today mm. has been the one that has led to productivity one way or the other. I say so. Okay. And again, I, say, I, say I've, I have this principle that may there never come a day in this country and in any country where the legislature works hand in gloves with the executive. If such a day comes, the public should take care and beat both of them out. So you feel because the executive is the legislature is supposed to check the executive. The executive is supposed to make sure that the legislature works within the ambit of the law, legislating okay. and being able to also check them. The president or the governor is one person and may not know the, the uh, propensity of the ministers, the permanent secretary, the directors general, it is the legislature in the course of their oversight, in the course of public hearing, in the course of defending the bills, in the course of public petition that brings out the different things that are happening in the different ministries, departments and agencies that even draws the attention of the governor and other ministers and even the president to what is happening within his government. Therefore, the kind of relationship that has been, it may not have been the best at all times, but it has been very productive. Okay. Under the Obasanjo administration, what the kind of relationship we had was such that we fought him. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Binta, this, uh, this we said is all, Masi mm. knew we did. Okay. And I think it led to a time when uh, His Excellency Mr. President, as he then was now said, this is a joke taken too far. Okay. Because we fought him. Okay, so, so. And that when we achieved one thing, one thing we, one thing we achieved was that Galio Manaaba and Dr. Chuba Okadibo, under their leadership, we now got the legislature self-accounting and infected the, um, the first line charge for the legislature to be on its own, not depending any manner on the executive. Okay. So that, that is how the legislature was, and that's how we've been. And under the, this administration, I hope we'll have time to... to uh, no, no, we're, we're going yes. to come to that. We're going to, I just want us to start from yeah. a premise. I, I'd like to bring in Dr. Adini here. Yeah. Uh, from your own perspective, do you get the impression that both arms understand their roles and functions as outlined in the 1999 constitution? Um, first of all, Larry, what I think interests me is to see that, you know, the relationship between the legislature and the executive is nothing extraordinary, okay. you know, because democracy is about the conflation of interest. And this interest can either be statutory or loose. You know, statutory in the sense of the trinity of the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, lose in the sense of having groups and individuals. All these groups will conflict in the democratic um, system. 
but that's okay. Um, but you, if you look at where we're coming from again, we're coming from collectively put together 30 years of military rule. That military rule witnessed a duopoly, a binary of the executive and the judiciary alone, where the executive was even more influential, more powerful than the judiciary. And now we had democracy that introduced the legislature, which is the core, the symbol of democracy, as it were. You know, you expect the executive not to be used to that arm of government. And you expect that the legislature, which is bored, which is enamored by the fact that they are a representative of the people, you expect, expect them to stand up to the executive and assert themselves. So within that matrix, you expect some tension. Look, we're talking about democracy today, and central to democracy is separation of powers. Separation of power essentially is the brainchild of um, Charles II, that Baron Montesquieu. And the, the, the theory was taken further by thinkers like Immanuel Kant and Thomas Paine in his book, The Rights of Man. What you are saying essentially is that, with like Senator alluded to, it's not a question of having absolute harmony, you know, but a question of checks and balance. You know, but how that checks and balance smooth things out is subject, is essentially dependent on the personalities at the hems of all the arms of government. If the personalities are rambunctious, if they are aggressive, if they are confrontational, if they are consensual, you know, it's going to reflect in the way uh, their relationship is. But in our own context, from 1979, uh, 1999 yes. to date, you will say that essentially it's not been determined, I, I, bet, I beg to say, by the interests of the people. Yes, there have been conscious attempts to direct the activities towards these interests, but there are still questions to be asked around it. The, the, the question I also put forward was, yes. do you think both arms, yes, you've said they, they shouldn't be friendly yeah, and that's all right. that, but yeah. do they understand their roles as outlined by the Constitution? Sometimes, actually, you find conflict in how the Constitution defines their roles, and sometimes it creates problems between them. Okay. But again, if there's an understanding, if the focus in their functions, in their expectations, is for the common good, they will all, they, 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 there shouldn't be any problem in their ability to reach a consensus on what the Constitution is actually saying. Okay. You know, they do understand their role. You cannot take that for granted because <coughs> it doesn't matter whatever you want to see about these political actors. Many of them are accomplished. Many of them are fulfilled men and women. You know, so understanding of the Constitution is just um, a, a matter of letters, a matter of uh, quality of understanding. We, we, we could take that for granted because the bureaucracy is also there. Consultants are always ever there to assist them. So understanding may not really be the question, but okay. it's, actually, it's actually a matter of disposition to performance. Okay. What is the level of their disposition to performance? Let, let me bring uh, in Israel. As a journalist, what would you say? You've been observing, you've also... Um, written about and covered a lot of what has transpired between the two arms. What's your own take? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I think it's been a learning process for the National Assembly mm -hmm. uh, since Nigeria's return, return to democracy in 1999. You know, there were five Senate presidents that were changed between the span of uh, seven years, Bet sorry, eight years, between 1999 and 2007, we had five Senate presidents. And that's to tell you that I agree in part with what Senator Enang said, that the way leadership emerges actually determines whether or not there's going to be an interface, successful interface or synergy between the executive arm of government and the legislature. We had a rather stable um, National Assembly between 2007 and 2015, owing to the fact that we had a leader in the person of Senator D Dr. David Mack, and that relationship was really very cordial with the executive arm of government between that period. I think. Uh, since 1990 till now, it's so far the best leadership of which the National Assembly had. And then coming on to, you know, between the period of 2015 and now, the yes. 8th National Assembly, I agree totally with Senator Inange that the way leadership comes into power will determine whether or not it is successful in having, you know, a cordial interface between the National Assembly and the presidency. But, but, but yeah. I, I would like to understand, yeah. should that be, should, should it be that because of the character of a person, it should affect how work is done, especially work laid out clearly no, by no, the no, Constitution? I'm going, to tell you, I'm going to tell you something. We need to be very clear about something. Yes. It's not just about the way the person emerges, but as well the disposition, like Dr. Abiodun said, mm. the disposition of the individual in question, who is in power. 
who is at the helm of affairs at the National Assembly. Okay. Now, you need a level of political maturity to be able to have that synergy. Okay, let, let, let me stop yeah. you there. We're, we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs>